just a reminder to start recording. Wonderful. All right. Um, Oh my goodness, so we've got quite a lot of um, folks here today. So look, hello everyone and welcome to our August webinar. I'm Leanne Noll and I'm delighted to be your host uh, today for this exciting panel discussion co-hosted by the Ascolite Learning Design and Open Educational Practices Special Interest Groups. Really excited. Um, but before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting here today. And for me, I reside at the beautiful, beautiful Bunurong lands uh, within Victoria Southeast. And we also pay our respects to our elders past and present and also extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, people joining us here today. Now, a bit about Ascolite for those who are new um, uh, to Ascolite. Ascolite is a non-for-profit uh, professional association focused on the educational use of technologies in tertiary education and also beyond. Our special uh, interest group, our learning design group, is led by Kashmira, myself, uh, Keith, and also Kate. Now, our SIG is a resource and network for academics and professionals uh, interested in learning design. And we provide a platform for professional development, exchanging of ideas, uh, sharing of practices and discussing latest trends in learning design. Um, to join our group, we have a very active LinkedIn page. We have over a thousand members. I encourage you to scan the QR code and join our group very collegial, very collaborative. We're here to support each other and grow the learning design space. Now, just a couple of things. Ascolite is obviously, there's a beautiful conference coming up at the end of this year, hosted at the University of Melbourne. And also just that day before the actual conference, we also um, there's also a third space uh, symposium that's also led by other six within our Ascolite community. So feel free to have a look at that and get active in that space. Now, I'm going to throw it over to Stephen Chang, who is part of our OEP SIG group. Over to you, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Stephen, and I coordinate open education programs at La Trobe, uh, and I'm one of the co-conveners of um, the Open Educational Practices SIG of Ascolite, um, and my other co-conveners are Adrian, Ash, and Jen. I, I think they're here, here today as well. And uh, we're really happy to be doing this first joint event with the Learning Design SIG. Um, if you haven't heard of us before, we're a community that includes ed tech folk, academics, librarians, and pretty much just anyone who's interested in open educational practices in Australasia. And yeah, we run a regular webinar program, which includes a journal club. Um, and, you know, we've covered topics like open pedagogy, student generated OER, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. open educational resources, that sort of thing, open textbooks and so on. And we also do more informal community meetings every month to basically share our insights, share our resources, talk about what we're doing, solve each other's problems. Um, and it's, a, yeah, really, really great community. Um, we put out a monthly digest, which is a basically a newsletter about Australasian happenings in the open educational practices world. Um, so you can sign up for updates on any, any of these things um, on our website, which I'll put in the chat. And uh, yeah, I just see so much synergy between our group and um, the learning design SIG. I mean, after all, you know, open educational resources are nothing without learning design to mm -hmm. meaningfully use, embed, design them into curriculum. Um, and also the third space aspect too, you know, a lot of non-traditional academic staff, non-traditional professional staff and everyone operating in that um, lovely interface mm -hmm. between academic and professional work. So a lot of synergy. So I'm looking forward to um, more collaboration soon. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen, and well said, absolutely well said. I think um, collaboration is key um, in our you know, world at the moment as well. All right, so look, now I'm excited to introduce to you to our panellists who will share their expertise and experiences in developing an open access book for learning designers. I'm going to give you a bit of intro to each of our wonderful um, panellists. So we have Keith Hegard, 
He's an academic lead at the University of Technology in Sydney, where he developed an innovative course combining micro-credentials and work-integrated learning. This course received the AUCT Learning Innovation Award in 2022 and a UTS Teaching and Learning Citation. So Keith's research focuses on social justice and learning design, earning him uh, awards such as the best publication from AUCT and early career research award from ASCO. Oh, fantastic, Keith. And also um, over 20 publications, including books. And he's also an Apple Distinguished Educator and also co-leads our learning design special interest group as well. So. <laughs> Next up, we have Mays Fatea. Um, now, Mayas is an educational technologist uh, specialist, also learning designer with extensive experience in higher education and open education advocate as well. Um, as of the publication of this book, she was the learning experience uh, design manager at UTS. Mays uh, specializes in creating uh, engaging learning materials and leading transformative projects and initiative in learning design and open education. Wow, so we have a lot of experience here. Um, she's received the 2023 UTS VC Professional Staff Excellence Award and the 2018 Blackboard Catalyst Award for Student Success. And as well, her PhD focuses on developing sustainable open educational resources and development model. So welcome, Mayas. Next, we have John Village, um, an academic um, for the Graduate Certificate in Learning Design at UTS, over a quarter of a century uh, in education, uh, teaching, training, and across various sectors. Senior learning designer at UTS um, has managed a, so previously has managed a team developing online and blended learning products. Um, John has also co-received the AECT Learning Engagement Division's 2022 Excellence in Innovation Award. His PhD fo uh, focuses on um, learning design and promotes learning transfer. John has contributed to the International Mathematical Thinkers Like Me project and supports a wide variety of diverse students in developing their mathematical identities. Amazing again. Thank you, John. Now, last but not least, we have Bruno Control Patero. Um, Bruno is a digital accessibility specialist at the Canberra Institute of Technology with 15 years of experience in various educational roles, holds a bachelor's degree in sciences and teaching and in translation and interpreting services. So along with multiple postgraduate diplomas in education accessibility, uh, Bruno's expertise is in technology enhanced learning, critical pedagogy, diversity, inclusion and digital accessibility. Now, as a queer and disabled advocate, she is dedicated to transforming education and society through inclusive and accessible uh, practices. Well, we have an esteemed, um, you know, list of panelists, and what a wonderful, um, exciting um, panel to see coming up as well. Now, how we'll work today, we each hear from our panelists, starting off with Keith who will provide context followed by um, our panelists with sharing their experiences and expertise. We will then have an opportunity to facilitate a call for ideas and contributions and open the floor to questions. I would encourage everyone to um, engage with the chat as well. We'll be monitoring that um, in the background, but without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Keith. Thank you, Keith. Wow. Thank you, Leanne. What a wonderful introduction. Uh, very, very gracious. Um, yeah, I uh, I was listening to you go, I'm like, yeah, I guess I have done those things. It's always <laughs> nice to hear someone else say it. And this is a bit of a different experience for me, because normally when you do a book launch, you're trying to convince people to to go out there and buy your book. And there's no such thing as a cheap book in, in academic publishing. But I don't have to do that in this case. Instead, I get to say, go out and read the book. And by the way, it's free to download. Um, and I quite like uh, that idea. Um, so I, I'm not going to talk for very long because uh, we, we I, I imagine you really want to hear about, um, you know, the, the chapters and the things and all those kinds of things, um, you know, the authors, what they've put into their books. But before I hand over to, to the authors, I want to talk a little bit about why this book is important and why now. Um, so a couple of things that I think are, are really, really important. And I can see all the questions coming through and that's wonderful. So so 
we will share the link to the book in the chat. Um, I think I did it at the start, but if you missed it, we'll do it again. And it will soon have its own DOI as well, okay? It's out there. It's published. Um, you can go and download it right now. But but stay and listen to the webinar first, okay? <laughs> um, all right. So why this book? Why now? Um, about five years ago, uh, I was mucking around in a kind of third space role while I was finishing off my profession, uh, my PhD, and, and doing what wasn't even called learning design at the time. I think I think they were calling me a teaching and learning adjunct or something like that, but I was basically doing learning design. And I I got to know all the other people in similar kinds of roles across the university. And I, I started talking to them about the work that they were doing and, and we shared ideas and tips. And I quickly realized that they came from an incredibly diverse background. You know, so I come from a, a, a classically educational background. I've taught high schools for a long time, in high schools for a long time. Uh, but I was working alongside people who came from computer science backgrounds or people who had graphic design backgrounds. But we were all calling ourselves learning and teaching adjuncts and eventually starting to calling ourselves learning designers. And then I got really interested in what is this job called a learning designer? Um, and and eventually I said to the university, you know what? You are struggling to find enough people to fill these roles. You're desperate to have them. You're undergoing this big transformation from one learning management system to another. Not a migration. It was a tra transformation. Um, why on earth don't you have your own special program to help develop learning designers? We've just released. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's out. You should be able to download it. <laughs> um, and and so we, I, I pitched that idea to them, and they said, "Well, go away and come up with a a program." And I wanted to do a master's of learning design, and eventually they took me down to a graduate certificate, which was the 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 birth of of the grad cert at learning design. And I like to lay claim to the fact that we were the first named learning design program in Australia. <laughs> uh, Peter Goodyear, uh, who some of you might know, always argues with me about that one. And he says, you know, his, his program at University of Sydney was really the first learning design program. And I'm like, well, but it didn't call itself learning design. Uh, and since that time, and this is the point I'm trying to make, I've noticed this explosion in similar kinds of programs, you know. So I understand down at Monash, Michael Henderson is setting up a bachelor's program in learning design, which is, promises to be fantastic. There's a program at QUT, which is very similar. And so what I think is happening is that there is suddenly a real interest in this work that that is variously called instructional design and learning design and learner experience design. My personal favorite are the people who call themselves learning architects or learning engineers. Um, whatever we call ourselves, and and I, I realize that some people like to get into the into the nitty gritty about the differences, and and I think there are there are bigger differences between institutions than perhaps across the profession. But whatever we call ourselves. As I was designing this course and I was drawing on all these experts and talking to everybody I possibly knew who, who could offer me anything at all about this, I realized that we didn't actually have much that was Australian based or Australasian based. Um, you know, so so if you go to the, the US, there's a, a long history of instructional design, often linked to technology and things like that. Um, if you go to the 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 UK and Europe, there's a, a, a longer history of learning design, but it wasn't exactly what I'm talking about. And of course, in Australia, there are some very significant academics who've researched learning design. But as a profession, as a group of like-minded individuals who share best practice and, and you know, advocate for our role within various settings, there wasn't, there was this, this gap um, that I thought we should really do something about there, that. And so, um, we, we set up this course, and, and of course, John, who's going to talk to you about his chapter a little bit later, was part of that. Um, and, and as we're going through, I, I was drawing all these um, US textbooks and these uh, European textbooks, and I was like, you know what, I really want uh, an Australian textbook, an Australasian textbook. And you know what, I really want it to be free. I mean, <laughs> people who know me well know that that you know the, the the university here. Whenever they roll me out to talk to people about things like the grad cert learning design, they've also always got a shepherd's kind of crook to to yank me off stage because as I get warmed up and carried away, I start saying education should be free, and and you know, 
all our micro credentials should be available for free for everyone. <laughs> and that, at that point, they kind of pull me off stage and say, actually, you have to pay for these kinds of things. Um, but I, I was excited about, well, maybe we could come up with a way to, to uh, supplement all of these courses that were out there with a, a professional textbook or an academic textbook uh, written by not just academics in the field like myself, but also written by people who who live the 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 life of a learning designer, who walk the walk and talk the talk. And I, I realise that 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 is a really blurry definition to make between the two. Um, but when Mays and I saw the the Council of Australian University Librarians grants for an open educational resource. Uh, we we said, this is our chance. And and I, I pitched the idea to Mays and Mays was like, yes, we can do this. And I was like, I have no idea about open educational resources. Uh, and, and I kind of wandered into a whole new world that I'm I'm very enthusiastic about and and feel very much at home now. Um and 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 the end result was this this incredible book that we've put together. Um it it is a wonderful mix of professional voices, people who are currently working in that whole mess of different kind of roles that learning designers often find themselves in, but also people who, who spend their time studying those kinds of roles and people who've moved in between the two. Um, I have no huge favourite chapters or anything like that. I don't think that's the, the right thing to do. Um, you know, as, as is always with these edited collections, I find the chapter that I wrote is probably the weakest in the whole book. So, so if you download it and you start off with chapter two, just jump over that one and go straight into chapter three, which is Maze's chapter. Um, and, and I hope you, you read Bruno, Bruno's and uh, John's chapters as well, because they're going to talk to you a little bit about those. Um, but it's my hope that by putting together a book like this, uh, we can continue to strengthen the conversations uh, that we as a profession, as learning designers have. And we can start to be very clear about our role within institutions and the very close alignment that learning designers should have. I don't say already have, but I think they should have with open educational practices. Um, and, and at the end of this session, um, you know, I, I really hope you'll take the chance to to share some other ideas for for uh, we've got one book right, but but I'm already envisioning a whole bookshelf of books about learning design, all published uh, via open education. Um, you know, so so this one was about accessibility and inclusion, uh, and I hope we get a chance to, to throw around some ideas about what the next volumes might be about. Uh, but I'm going to stop talking now, um, and I'm going to hand over to Mays, who's going to talk a little bit more about open education. Thank you, Keith, um, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, so the idea of uh, putting together a book about learning design, particularly focusing on inclusivity and diversity aspect uh, with a group of people who have a lot of experience, as you can uh, also read uh, from their bios, but a lot of um, in st strategies and uh, solutions that they weave through their chapters, which I'm sure you'll find interesting to read and um, reuse in your own context. Um, as uh, uh, Stephen mentioned earlier in, uh, today, that open education um, is nothing without learning designers to help us embed um, open education in curriculum. Um, I think that's a really nice uh, synergy that uh, Stephen put to us and it actually aligns very well with what we try to convey in th through the book. But also I try to focus a little bit on that in, in chapter, which is sequence chapter four. But um, as we hope to grow this, uh, might change the sequence for now. But also what Keith mentioned to you to skip his chapter, I would not recommend that. <laughs> there is a lot of uh, great ideas that I also built on what Keith introduced in terms of the existing frameworks that we can rely on to um, weave in open education practices in um, as, as learning designers in curriculum. And um, in Keith's and Camille's chapter, we'll see some uh, actually practical examples to that. So what I tried to also focus on 
um, not only in my chapter really, but also in this work as a whole, um, really the idea first that as learning designers, uh, we have a lot to offer uh, for for open education. Um, one um, one of the things that I talked about is how we possess um, skill set that helps us actually to bring open education practices to um, uh, learning and teaching a little bit more um, meaning in more meaningful way. And Keith mentions how. Um, He's amazed by the uh, diversity of uh, the learning designers' communities. But also what is interesting in our community is the special skill sets that we have. So we do have special skill sets. Given the time now, we have a lot of disruptions happening um, in higher education and a lot of changes happen. And I find... Um, us as learning designers or third space practitioner or people who sit in between um, academics who know their knowledge and students and also the institution and sit there in the middle and try to uh, negotiate, uh, try to uh, communicate, build relationships. Uh, these particular skills about negotiation, building skills, maintaining relationships with faculties are important not only to uh, within open education practices, but also um, other things. But for open education in particular, and if you want to focus on this, um, I've got a lot of experts in the room today who can talk about open education uh, in more depth. But um, one thing that I would like to mention is that um, there, there are always amazing work derived by librarians, and we've got fantastic librarians also joining us today. Uh, open education conversation is usually derived by librarians. And what I would like to um, uh, bring in my chapter, the idea is that we really need, should work a little bit closer with librarians and help advocate for open education practices, drawing on our skills that we have as learning designers uh, to communicate with faculties with academics, we know the language that they use. And um, they come to us asking, how do I redesign this module in my subjects? What do I do in this assessment? So we often help them in that aspect. So this is this is one, one area how, as learning designers, uh, we can um, deploy open education practices more consistently um, um, in, uh, in, our, in our work. Um, the other thing that uh, we try to convey is that how our open education movement, if we all only focus here in, in our Australasian context, is a little bit missing. And um, and I wouldn't say probably missing is not the, the, not the right word, but probably at early stage. And uh, Keith mentioned uh, the... Um, how uh, people uh, in uh, US and Canada and uh, UK have done amazing work in uh, publishing openly about uh, instructional design. Um, and by introducing this work, we, we contribute to this work, to this body of knowledge, but we take that uh, more uh, tailored perspective uh, to, our, to our context. Uh, and the last point that I'd like to share with you also, that I also try to touch on in uh, some of the sections in my chapter, is that how we, as learning designers, and how learning design, particularly as a profession, is actually rooted in human-centered design approaches. So we have um, a commitment in our work as learning designers to enhance um, society to enhance to enhance learning and teaching, which eventually enhances society and have that impact. But but if we look at the impact that we have uh, through our work on enhancing uh, social justice in education and how what do we do to do that? What are the practices that we do in our learning design that contribute to social justice? Um, whether in designing content or whether with uh, contributing to enhancing curriculum. And through open education, and this book is actually a great example of, to that, 
um, through open through open education, we have the the opportunity to to contribute to um, uh, enabling social justice in education. Uh, given that human centered approach that we already practice in 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 learning design, um, this obviously puts on us that. Um, ethical responsibility. Uh, for example, you will um, uh, read through the chapters that talk about uh, cultural diversity uh, that uh, introduced by uh, Nyong and uh, accessibility chapter that introduced by Katie and uh, Rhiannon talking about inclusivity and accessibility and what do they mean for uh, students and how that actually contribute directly to social justice. So these are the things that we try to convey through the chapters in some examples um, to bring it closer to uh, the fact that through open education practices, we can do that. Uh, open education is a mean to achieve accessibility. Of course, open education is not the only way, but it's a great opportunity to uh, make content more accessible, um, focusing also on the fact that things to be made more accessible is not an add-on necessarily it's something missing and that we should work to uh, get it right so um i'll i'll, I'll stop there because i've just covered maybe all the three points that i'd like to uh share with you about this um this work as a whole but also on on my chapter thanks mate all right um and now we're gonna hear from one of the other authors of the chapters uh bruna all the way from a very chilly canberra <laughs> over to you bruna Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Keith. Uh, I just wanted to start by thanking everyone for having me here and for Keith for inviting me to write a book chapter um, to begin with. Um, the idea of writing this book chapter to me seemed crazy when Keith came to me and said, hey, we're writing this book chapter. Why don't you write a chapter about what do you wish people could learn about learning design or people that want to learn more about being inclusive in their teaching practices or in designing learning experiences. I immediately thought that I wasn't cut for it. There was nothing that I could add. And then Keith was like, well, maybe, maybe think about it and let me know if you change your mind or if you have any interesting ideas. So I went back and started thinking about how I entered the third space and how I understood learning design myself. And I know it was a very troubled time because I didn't even know how to explain what I did. I remember having interactions with professional staff and with academic staff. And every time they would ask me what I did and I was like, well, I do a little bit of this, I would do a little bit of that. But there wasn't like this definition of what a learning design meant. And this I'm talking like seven years ago. And it was quite interesting because there was the need for professionals like us, but they didn't know how to define us or how to write position descriptions. So they ended up getting a whole bunch of people with many different skills that were brought into this role. And I remember myself thinking like, I have to learn what a learning designer do. Like I have to be able to better explain myself. And then I start reading, I love reading. So I started reading books about the accidental learning designer or things I wish I knew before I became a learning designer. And yes, they were quite helpful in some sense, but they still didn't really help me with the how of doing things. The, these books sometimes are very focused on um, the design for learning, but sometimes they're missing on the accessibility and inclusivity bits. And then you have to think about UDL and how you can embed this in your practice, but also digital accessibility. But I just wanted to write something that would resonate to people and that would just show how learning design can be broken down into simple steps. And that's why I decided to go with the baking a cake um, analogy. I, I don't think designing a learning experience is just following a recipe and following steps. But once you have the steps and once you have the recipe, you can kind of like improvise and add your own taste to it and change to whatever you need and to suit your, um, your target audience, your students. And I've been always really, really passionate about accessibility as a whole because um, I don't know if everyone um, knows or if anyone knows Paulo Freire, one of the brightest educators in Brazil. Um, he has a famous saying that I'll poorly translate now, um, but he says that education doesn't change the world. So education transforms people and people change the world. So this was a, always a very powerful thing to me. And in Brazil, um, 
the lack of education and the, la the lack of access to education to people is a, is a very, a very distressing thing. And I keep thinking, I, I catch thinking with myself, how I can make the difference, how I can assist people in understanding more things so that they, they can actually be active participants in society. So this is why I studied science and teaching and did translation. And when you read my CV, you're like, oh, she's all over the place. But my, in my head, I'm, the, I'm the, the thread that unites everything. So I studied science because I wanted to be able to break down co um, complex um, content, content and concepts into digestible ideas. And I started teaching so that I could um, assist people understand science. And then I started translation because I wanted to be able to translate really good stuff from English into Portuguese so that more people would have access to it. But I didn't know how to do this into the learning design world. So I just started experimenting with a few things myself. And the idea of embedding accessibility seemed quite simple in my head. And I was like, well, it's common sense. Everyone should be doing this by now. Why isn't everyone doing it? And I started getting very interested in talking to um, academics and talking to professional staff to actually see what they understood about accessibility and what they understood about inclusive learning design practices. And I realized that sometimes, even when people know what accessibility and inclusivity is, they actually don't know how to apply this to their, to their teaching area. Or sometimes there's those very specific academics, they'll say, well, I understand, but how can I apply this to maths or how can I apply this to science? It's a very like foreign concept. So in my baking the cake analogy, I basically talk about two things, the importance of considering accessibility and inclusivity from the start, because I've been in many, in many situations where we had to retrofit content or we had to retrofit accessibility so that everyone could access content. And it is a very, very time consuming um, a process. I remember that I had to once, uh, it's one of my vignettes. So everything that I wrote is based on my experience and the experience of friends and colleagues working in the space. But I remember I had to make one 60 page document accessible. And that took me weeks to finish. Whereas if we had thought about how to make this document accessible to begin with, it would have taken a lot less time. Um, so, and I started doing research in how, how much money people spend on retrofitting things and making things accessible. So I started thinking, how can I explain this to my academics? Um, I was working at the university sector now, but now I'm working oh, then, but now I'm working um, in the TAFE, CIT sort of sector. But then with the academics, I would always go with this example. And um, in every single job interview, I would say the same thing. So everyone that knows me now know this analogy that I would say, well, accessibility is like baking a cake. You can't just sprinkle accessibility on top. You can't be like a decorative part of your, your work. Like, oh, you change the colors to make it more accessible. You make sure you run through a screen reader, read out loud, and then it picks up thing, things. Um, it has to be considered as like the fundamental, one of the fundamental ingredients that you use in your cake. So it would be equivalent to the baking powder. So it has to be there. Otherwise, you bake, you, you can still bake a cake. You'll probably taste nice, but not everyone will be able to enjoy it. So that was the idea behind including accessibility as the first thing. And the second idea in the book was what really interested me and what I couldn't find written anywhere is how to get buy-in because it, you can go and design the most beautiful learning experience, the most inclusive one, but how do you get people to actually use it? And how do you get professional staff and academic staff on board in this journey? So I created the analogy of serving the cake. So it's not only about baking the cake and making something pretty and something that works for everyone, but how do you serve the cake to someone? And how do you make sure that you're aligning, like in terms of learning design, you're aligning their interest to what you actually created. So in the book, I talk about different examples of how I went about it, but it was about finding a common ground or explaining to academics um, things like, well, I know you may look at accessibility and inclusivity uh, with, a, with a bit of a, a, a bad taste, um, a, a bit of a bitter taste, because sometimes what happens is that Academics are not uh, fully aware of the different conditions and access requirements they have in class. And then when it's um, assessment time, exam time, then 
they are dumped into this many things that they have to do and convert files and um, make sure everything is accessible. When in reality, if they applied some basic UDL principles to begin with, they wouldn't have to work. Um, they wouldn't have to work as hard to make it accessible to everyone, it would be accessible to most people. And in some cases, of course, there would be differentiation, like we would need to differentiate. But if you started from scratch, just being accessible, then you would be reaching like a bigger audience. And this was one of the ideas. So I, I tried connecting to my, to my academics in a way that I didn't know it was needed when I started doing learning design. I thought that the main idea of learning design was designing for learning. Um, but I realized later on that 50% of my role was actually building relationships and building trust and understanding where the issue is. And I think that that's, that's what makes um, learning design to me something magic and powerful. And it is about people. It is about relationship. It is understanding and, and raising awareness, understanding where people are coming from, because we want to be inclusive, right? So we have to understand different points of view and try to, to reach a common ground. And one thing that I really liked about this book, and this is not uh, necessarily highlighted in my chapter, is that a lot of people are talking about um, working with students with lived experiences, and this is fantastic. I absolutely recommend everyone that they work with students with lived experiences to actually see if what they're producing is very, uh, is, is really accessible. But invite people with lived experiences as well to be part of this of these experiences of writing books and talking about these things because I write in different ways and I can't express myself well I could try but I can't express myself in the standard format like of academic writing academic publishing I could do that but my brain just thinks in different ways and being allowed to ex to explain myself in, in a different way and make people understand new things was quite powerful to me because it, the book was truly inclusive. So I felt inclusive, included in every single step of the way. And I felt that there was nothing wrong with the way that I expressed myself. On the contrary, diversity was actually welcomed and different ways of expressing and different ways of representing content. And the other thing is that it is um, an open education re uh, resource. So it's open to everyone, which is also the, the basics of inclusivity. So I see a lot of books behind a paywall and they are about inclusive practices, but then there's already a barrier for you to, to get uh, to, to that content. So... I know I'm rambling, rambling about things here, but it's just I'm passionate about assisting people to have access to good quality education and to have access to content, regardless of where they're coming from, regardless of their background and regardless of the access requirements. It is a very hard job. And I think that sometimes it falls onto us learning designers to fill this gap. And it's great because we have a multitude of skills and we can definitely contribute in this area. And sometimes it may seem daunting, like how do I go about this? Or how do I go about convincing my academics to use it? But there's, there's always things that you can you can implement here and then there's always really great advice that you can um, that you can join that you can uh, um, that you can take and I think that collaborating with more experienced people as well really opens up um, a lot of opportunities and a lot of like spaces for you to be learning more sharing your, your ideas and just don't be don't be like me afraid to share your ideas because you think you're not contributing to anything because you may be, you may be assisting a lot of people along the way. Thank you, Bruna. Wonderful. Um, anything that uh, has got that much passion and uh, that talks about Paulo Freire is right up the <laughs> my, right up my alley. All right, um, and and let's hear from our next author, who's who's John. John, over to you. All right, brilliant. Thanks so much, Keith. Um, so when Keith and Mays approached me about this, um, about my chapter, Designing for Equity and Learning, I thought, oh, brilliant. I can integrate lots of great tools and techniques uh, from some brilliant educators and academics that I've worked with on, on a project called Mathematical Thinkers Like Me. Uh, so this was a project based in the United States. Uh, where um, we were focusing on uh, students that were um, from disadvantaged backgrounds um, uh, to improve their mathematics and their identities as uh, mathematics uh, mathematicians. Uh, I was interested in creating my chapter as the 
are really practical tools for designers and educators to use. Um, and, um, and so, and my chapter was focused also on uh, interviews with um, some colleagues that I work with on, on this project. Um, a few themes that appeared um, as I was putting my chapter together. Um, the first one was around, you know, the importance of understanding your learners um, and strategies to help educators and designers build environments, you know, to see what students are seeing uh, and to understand what students are knowing. Um, being culturally responsive, um, themes emerged of, you know, ways to teach to and through the strengths of students, ways to represent cultures and backgrounds in learning materials, um, and in the promotion of collaborative practices, um, ways for students to learn from each other. So, you know, how can we promote equity among students themselves? Um, and can we use technology and ways to use technology in, in promoting equity? Um, I interviewed three brilliant individuals. I'll introduce them to you briefly. Um, Annie Fetter uh, was a mathematics and education specialist. Um, and Annie is a firm believer in the notice and wonder routine, which I'll introduce you in, in a moment. Um, Melanie Needle. Um, is a firm believer of the four H's of belonging-centered math instruction. Um, Melina also introduces students to this thing called ingenious influences. Um, and lastly, Richard Chen, uh, he was an education pro program developer. Um, and Richard is a genius on a on, on, free, fully, freely available online collaborative platform called VMT or Virtual Math Teams. Um, I want to give you the cliff's notes of all of these tools. Um, Annie's technique, Notice and Wonder, or Annie's routine, uh, Notice and Wonder, um, is all about nurturing and valuing students' ideas. Um, it starts with, with giving students a problem and asking them, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Um, getting students to share these ideas um, and getting students to sh with, by sharing these ideas, sharing them without any judgments to students' ideas. And also importantly, any suggests to not reword any students' ideas as well. Keep them as students say them. Um, and lastly, you know, educators listening, valuing, and importantly, using students' ideas as they teach the lesson. And so that classic case of learning something by actually linking it to something that students know um, and have experienced. Um, second technique is about, you know, the four H's of belonging-centered math instruction. Um, so my interview with Melanie unpacked uh, this this uh, this strategy. It's a heuristic and it's a partner activity where students take home an interest interview questionnaire. Um, it's about their home, hobbies, hopes, and heritage. So, for example, a question on this interest interview might be, "What do you do on the weekend? Um, who are the most important people in your community, and how do they use maths? Um, you know, do you have a part-time job? You know, where do you use maths in this part-time job? You know, that sort of thing." Um, there's also a complementary partner activity uh, to the uh, interest interview. And what Melanie does uh, with the four H's is she compiles all students' responses um, on a spreadsheet. She aligns them with the curriculum standards. Um, and most importantly, as the year goes on, all of these interests and from, from the uh, interest interview questionnaire are integrated into lessons. Um, so when Melanie is teaching something like ratios and rates, um, any students who are interested in music, um, she calls them out and says, hey, you're going to really love this next activity um, uh, because it relates to musical notation in this way. Um, and so, yeah, that's a quick little overview of the four H's. Um, Melanie also introduces this great technique called ingenious influences. Every single day, uh, Melanie introduces students to someone inspirational, influential, and provides a quote by that person. Um, 
Melanie also introduces Notice and Wonder when she introduces uh, these inspirational people. Uh, and also, as the year goes on, uh, with one you know influential person being introduced each day to students, um, she actually links these to students for H's. And so she might have you know a famous math a famous musician or a famous uh, uh, mathematician and that sort of thing. Um, Melanie also, you know, um, gets students to create vision boards that represent their goals. Um, she gets students to write personal letters to themselves um, that they, you know, outline how they're going to achieve these goals. And at the midpoint in the year and at the end of the year, she actually reviews these goals with students um, to see how they're tracking and um, uh, with, with their goal setting. Lastly, um, my interview with Richard uh, was about virtual math teams. Um, I'll just play a little sample here of this online collaborative environment. Um, so this is a, an environment that we developed over three years um, in, in, the, uh, in the project. It was a collaborative environment where teachers could plug in existing Desmos or GeoGebra activities that they've been using in class and have students collaborate in this online environment through text chat and voice to text. Um, my interview with Richard was all about, you know, the importance that students actually placed on participation. Students really value when, uh, when their uh, colleagues are participating in this online environment. Um, as a designer and developer, uh, you know, Richard had a really big focus on less is so much more. Um, there were so many things that we could have plugged into this online platform. So for example, hey, if someone's not collaborating, we could have had a message pop up that says, hey, you haven't said something in 10 minutes, what's going on? Um, um, whereas this less is more approach, you know, we actually took a step back and said, well, oh, actually, let's get the teachers to, you know, generate some collaborative norms with the students and have the students actually write these collaborative norms. Um, so yeah, virtual math, virtual math teams, an online, free, freely available collaborative platform. Um, so my strategies were all about kind of practical strategies for designers and educators to implement, um, focusing around these kind of three, three areas, understand your learners, being culturally responsive, and this virtual math teams platform that promotes collaborative practices. Um, do check out my chapter. Um, I've got some great videos on, on all three of these brilliant individuals um, sharing, uh, sharing their knowledge and skills. Um, and yeah, hope to hear from you if you have any questions about it. Thank you, John. Um, if you, if you uh, do want to reach out to the, the authors, uh, Bruna and John, um, please, uh, Bruna and John, if you feel comfortable, put your, your email in the the chat and people can email you directly if they, if they wish to. Um, all right, now it's over to you guys, I believe. Um, it's time to, uh, I, I can see the chat's been quite lively already um, and, and lots of good discussions about different kinds of licenses and which one is most appropriate. Um, yeah, so I, I think Kashmir, are you going to take control of the chat and the questions and all of that kind of stuff? Should I leave that in your hands? Yeah, sure. Um, I think Kate is also answering and replying some questions and uh, Kate do you want to uh, have any questions first before I get started or anything in the chat sorry I've been a um, open plan office so it's hard to talk um, but I believe James had a couple one was about licenses and one was about what is unique to Australian learning design so I'm not sure oh, sorry J James I'm not sure if um, if uh, he wanted to use the mic at all or otherwise we could read those questions out uh, yeah I can jump on um, yeah the first question is pretty simple I was just Curious, since you've carved out the uh, Australasian piece, like what is distinct or unique about um, learning design down under? Um, I'd be curious to know how we may or may not differ from the rest of the world. Uh, the other question is just around licensing, and it's really a broader question because I don't quite understand why, but there seems to be a, 
normative kind of adoption in uh, sort of Australasian open education to kind of default to the non-commercial licence. And I just, I'm still trying to understand why, because I, I, I do know it appeals to people at first glance, but I think they don't realise that it undermines reuse and restricts sort of the innovation that can come from that material in um, quite difficult ways. Um, a lot of it revolves around what exactly is commercial. So, you know, a private university is commercial, so it can't reuse those or, or remix those texts. Uh, but that's just one example, a private practitioner who wants to, you know, unis are getting rid of learning designers. <laughs> so when you guys end up kind of going private, you can't reuse those texts because you're self-employed and you're commercial. So it has a lot of unintended, I think, unintended consequences. And I'd just like to see people thinking through their licensing a bit more. Um, I can't reuse any of that, for example, on in the Wikimedia Foundation projects because it's they don't accept non-commercial licences. People have to be able to innovate on that material. You can still have attribution, et cetera, for it to be truly open. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for sharing that, James. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the first part of, or the first question, the one about the differences. Um, just with my own thoughts and perspectives and why I thought it was really important because I think, um, and I, I might have suggested it, but perhaps not gone into as much detail as I might have liked. I think um, in Australia, the the learning design field, the learning design profession um, is, is quite new. Uh, it's developing. It's immature, I guess, if you want to, you know, I, I don't like that particular phrase, <laughs> um, but I think... And I think that has its its challenges, um, and some of those challenges are that uh, I seem to feel like I spend half my time talking to people about what learning design is and, and explaining it. Um, and I know lots of other people share that kind of feeling, um, but it also has has advantages because I think um, we have the opportunity to explore new approaches and new ideas in a much more easy way than than might be the case in, for example, North America. Um, which is very structured. One of the things that that I, I've noticed um, is, it, especially in learning design, is the 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 real division in Australasia between corporate learning design and um, academic learning design, for want of a better phrase. Uh, and I find that really disappointing. That the you know often we we do very similar things, but we do them sometimes in quite different ways and and for different reasons. And I think. I think finding a way to to bridge that gap in Australia is something that I think would be worth investing a bit of time and effort in. Um, I noticed Kate um, also put a really good response in the the chat about all the differences that she notices as well. But anyone else want to share thoughts and differences? I mean, John, you were just over in the US earlier in the year, weren't you? Absolutely, yeah. Um, the, it, it's very interesting, Keith. It's almost like those kind of discussing those kind of nuances where, or similarities and differences, but also... Um, comparing fields with fields, private sector, private sector, tertiary with tertiary, and yeah. All right, yeah, okay. Um, and does anyone want to jump in and answer the the second part of the question, the question about the the NC, non-commercial part of the licence? Because I'm, I'm well out of my depth on that one, I'll be honest. <laughs> um, I think there are a lot of um, uh, opinions about the use of licences, and I do agree with uh, what James said that, uh, NC and also some so non-commercial in Creative Commons, there are six types of licenses. Um, two of them actually not considered open, open enough. Therefore, are open, uh, particularly the non-derivative. But the I think the conversations usually and the debates is around the non-commercial and share alike. Non-commercial prohibit others from making use of the work for commercial purposes. And I do agree with James uh, that, yes, um, sometimes if I was someone else would like to make use of part of the book uh, for a service that which is paid service, they won't be able to do that until they get a permission from us in this case. So this is what 
um, where James, uh, you, you coming from, and I do appreciate that. I wasn't really aware of the Wikimedia um, allowing the use of uh, NC work, which is really interesting to me. But for us, why we chose that? Um, I think to this to answer this question, two parts first is that, uh, as Keith mentioned, we would like the work that we do to continue to be free and available for everyone. And adding a, a commercial barrier maybe would prohibit others from um, uh, making um, uh, or using the work more freely. So this is one one aspect. Um, and the other one, um, there I think probably a, a something that we all kind of found would agree on made sense for us at that point of time. So I think and thank you so much. And I I have this. Um, I mean, like logically, I think that if we want to put it or create something that should go to everyone for free, then you would not allow other people to make money out of this, right? Like for right. the commercial use. So that, so that makes sense. But I have questions around accessibility, and I was looking at all the participants, and there are lots of you who has like a incredible like. Uh, hold over accessibility and understanding. So when we talk about um, uh, accessibility, I'm thinking, okay, we the first ideas that come into people's mind is around some sort of like disability. And if not, uh, it's like you, um, so for, for my, my own example, I, I work very, very well if somebody tells me, uh, so there is a paper and somebody said, oh, you know, this paper talks about this, even in like one minute, and then I read it, it makes a lot more sense to me than if I try to read and, and comprehend and uh, try to understand it. Mm -hmm. So those kind of accessibility um, features that it is individuals, uh, so those kind of things, falls under accessibility or personal preferences. That's what I, I'm thinking I want to know. Mm. I'm just uh, keeping one eye on the time, Kashmir. Do you think we should wrap it up? Yeah, we should <laughs> if if there is no answer, but we can continue our discussion offline as well because I know most of you. So, but yeah, I was thinking like, am I like part of that that inclusion? You know, like because at, as such, I have no need of you know special need, but I do, which is very subtle and not identified as kind of like accessibility. So, but yeah, these are all like we will talk in, in your course in uh, maybe part two or like any other forum, maybe in the um, uh, symposium that we are going to have just before the Ask a Light conference. So um, thank you so much everyone for coming and discussing and um, uh, contributing and at least you will take away some ideas and thank you panel for this wonderful free resource available, make it available to everyone. Um, and Keith, um, um, just don't tell anyone, but I also think that education should be free for everyone, uh, but uh, it's just two of us. <laughs> I, I reckon there's more than just two of us. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you everyone for sharing your ideas and um, knowledge and uh, takeaways and everything. And please feel free to join us in our next webinar. It happens every third Friday of the month uh, at 12 p.m. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.